We have a team of undergraduates who are working on how we're going to improve hockey using AI. We actually have uh, installed real-time cameras in the hockey rink. As a game goes on, we catch the information. We can then later process. We can follow the individual players, the puck, what people were doing, isolate things. So we're now trying to talk to the coaches and things and figure out how to make that really useful. From the Curtis R. Priam Experimental Medium Performing Arts Center, MPACT, on the campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, I'm your host, John Wexler, and this is Crashing the Faculty Lounge. Our guest today is Dr. Jim Hendler. He is the director of the Future of Computing Institute and Tetherless World Professor of Computer, Web, and Cognitive Sciences at RPI. He's also director of the RPI-IBM Artificial Intelligence Research Collaboration. He has offered over 450 books, technical papers, and articles in the areas of open data, semiotic, web, and artificial intelligence, and data policy and governance. His, some of his other accomplishments, just to name a few, is he has been Chief Scientist Information Systems Officer at the U.S. Defense Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA, awarded the Exceptional Civilian Medal from the U.S. Air Force, selected as an internet web expert by the U.S. government and helped launch usdata.gov open data website. He is a fellow in the following organizations, the U.S. National Academy of Public Administration, the AAAI, AAAS, ACM, BCS, and IEEE. As you can hear, Dr. Hedler is a big deal in the world of AI and computer science, and he's even a bigger deal on campus here at RBI. And we are thrilled to be able to speak with him today. Welcome, Jim. Thanks, John. So my first question for you is, you know, we have very smart listeners. We have current students, prospective students, and their parents. So they're going to be very disappointed with my first question. But being the expert in AI and breaking it down, explain what AI is and when did it start coming about? So artificial intelligence is really a large field that has been formed around the pursuit of Originally, it was trying to understand how humans think by modeling it with computers, but over time, it became more and more about how can we get computers to do things that traditionally were thought of as human. Uh, the field started under the, under the name machine intelligence in England. Uh, it actually started in the U.S. in 1956 at a summer school Um where that was the term that was where the term artificial intelligence was used for the first time. It had a very rocky start. Um, everyone thought language was going to be this really easy thing to deal with. Turned out to be hard. All sorts of other things we do as humans turn out to be much harder than you'd expect. Um, so it's been a an active area of research for quite a long time. My first paper in the field I realized recently was in 1977. And, um, you know, it's still going. So what really, though, made the difference is in the past few years and why it's suddenly come to everybody's attention has been sort of the perfect wave of three things. One is for us to train these AIs to do human-like tasks, we need a lot of data. Well, the web and the Internet and social media created a lot of data, especially in language. Second thing is you need very powerful computers. And uh, some of those have to be special purpose. And the, uh, I won't say irony, the amazing thing about sitting in the Curtis R. Prem Center is the thing that was the big breakthrough in computation for AI was something called the graphics processor unit being turned out to be really good for doing certain kinds of AI computations. Uh, the inventor of the GPU was Curtis Priam. Mm -hmm. And um, and for those who are out there, Curtis Priam's class of 1982 at RPI and is vice chair of our board and the namesake of this building for the donation that he made to the university. And and when we get to quantum later, right. <laughs> also right. a leading donor in that. But so, um, so that was enough machines with the special purpose enough data, and then there were some algorithms that were kicking around for a long time, and we knew they could be scaled, but how to scale them was very questionable, and some breakthroughs happened around the 2013, 14, 15 timeframe, 
where all of a sudden all these things came together. So we had the right programs, the right data, and the right computation. And suddenly things started shooting up. First in vision, the ability to recognize images, things like that. Uh, automated vehicles were a big part of that. But then language came along. And so now what most people are talking about is the what are called large language models or um, ChatGPT, BARD, right. Google's systems, et cetera. And that's kind of how it came about, it was a lot of hard work by a lot of people over a long time, and then a confluence of a And bunch so of you have students in your class now here at RPI at the undergrad and grad level, and then we have high school students. Where do you tell them, and where do you see this all going five to 10 years from now from when they're entering the workforce from that standpoint, or research, or going into right. further research? Well, so I think there are several different answers in that space, right? One is, I think the stuff that's got everyone so excited right now, chat GPT and other kind of things, which I think we'll probably talk about yeah. later, um, I think people are gonna start to realize that, hey, that's not so smart, and what it really is is a great productivity aid. So it'll become more and more embedded in the things we do, but less and less, something so excited on it so exciting on its own meanwhile there's tremendous amounts of ai research to be done both in solving real world problems health and uh climate and sustainability and all those sorts of issues but also even just to keep th things going uh recently bill gates said you know chat gpt5 is probably not going to be much better than chat gpt4 we're kind of hitting a plateau uh, by 2035, if you wanted to have ChatGPT-8 at its current rate of growth, you would have to use all the electricity in the United States. Wow. That doesn't seem likely. No. So much of the research going on is things like we have a lot of work here at RPI looking at how do we take these AI algorithms and move them to special purpose hardware, which might be um, much more energy efficient. How do we create new algorithms that don't need as much computation? How do we specialize the data for particular kinds of problems, et cetera? Cool. And tied into that, how do you, how has it impacted how you teach, how your colleagues teach, and how you, you're seeing students learning, particularly at RPI? Sure, well, um, gosh, well, let's start, let's start with the easy one there, right? Sure. We have a bunch of AI courses. We really have a few different things going on in AI courses. In computer science, though, you know, we have both a theoretical course, which is really aimed more at seniors, and what we've now done is put much more AI programming into uh, sophomore and junior year. Uh, that also includes some machine learning and real-world tests. So, so we're trying to get our students to really quickly get their hands on real-world problems, real-world data, use the tools that are out there. So there's this AI toolbox that wasn't there a few years ago. So you don't have to start from scratch. Now, again, if you want to become a researcher and really get it deeply into it, you know, sort of moving into master's and PhD level, then you need the theory, and that's what we teach kind of much more at the, the senior and grad level. Okay. Now, throughout the campus, we have courses in machine learning, we have courses in applying AI in engineering, applying AI in a lot of different fields. And one of the things we're actually trying to do now is create a new multidisciplinary master's program aimed at bringing students who've had these different kind of training together to look not just at AI, but really at the global challenges of today and say, how can AI help a team of scientists solve something like the impact of climate change on human infrastructure or fighting mis- and disinformation on the web, things like that. As you can hear, there are a lot of great things taking place at Rensselaer. Rensselaer is located in Troy, New York, and our admissions office is open six days a week for visits. We'd love to have you come and visit and experience all this for yourself. To do so, you can go to go.rpi.edu backslash visit. To register to come to campus for a visit, go.rpi.edu backslash visit. We were talking before the show 
um, in regards to how AI is across campus and outside of computer science and some areas that might surprise people like myself and others where I, AI is being used where we may not necessarily think of it being used. Yeah, so uh, I can almost not think of anywhere it's not being used right now. So, for example, uh, we had a big project in health and AI here. We work very closely with the Center for Biotechnology and in, uh, Interdisciplinary Studies so that we can talk about um, all sorts of things having to do with health, biomedicine, bio, um, uh, you know, right. biochem, sure. bioengineering. Uh, in engineering, virtually every field is now using machine learning as, as one of the tools to um, help make progress. So, so more and more, it's easier to collect data and then use the AI tools to look at that data and say, here's some possibilities of things you can look at. And then the, the scientist, the engineer, the business major, whatever, can look at those things and start to say, hey, that one looks interesting. Let's pursue it. So AI is becoming kind of a, a very important tool in helping people pick projects, work projects. And you know, I can't. I almost can't think of anything across campus that doesn't have it. In the humanities, we of course have to look at the ethics, the policy. Sure. You know, because these things are changing how work works, how people do things. Uh, is it cheating to hand in an essay that was written by ChatGPT? The answer is yes. <laughs> That's a heads up for the students out there. You might find this one as a real surprise, but um, we have a team of undergraduates who are working on how we're going to improve hockey. Wow. using AI. We actually have uh, installed real-time cameras in the hockey rink. As a game goes on, we catch the information. We can then later process. We can follow the individual players, the puck, what people were doing, isolate things. So we're now trying to talk to the coaches and things and That's figure great. out how to make so that really useful. You've been doing that and been working with the coaches and that and what what's the outcome of that like what lines working better or what players are playing at high productivity what maybe offensive scheme works best or the or the in the competition so up until up until this year most of the research has been how the heck do we do this right right so following a hockey player I, isolating a particular player what they're doing where is the puck how is that moving these are really pretty complicated yeah. ai problems uh the National Hockey League and others put, you know, those teams put millions and millions of dollars into doing some of this stuff. We're doing it with a bunch of undergraduates. Right. And, and they are surpassing <laughs> what's right. out there. So those of you out there, our, our men's and women's ho ice hockey teams play at the Division One level. They're in the ECAC conference. Last year, um, the winner of the national title for men's hockey came from that conference. So it's a highly competitive conference that you see a lot of NHL players come from. That's right. And our, and our arena holds about 4,000, 5,000 people. So what Jim's talking about is not easy. It's a big arena, but it's pretty interesting, and it's you know it's the way, probably the wave of where other schools are going. We are now starting to work with the coaches on how to really turn this into a productive tool. We're starting to talk to some of our alumni about yeah. supporting it yeah. uh, because we have to make sure we can get this research done. But you know, to me, and this is a theme I'll be happy to return to later, one thing that's really exciting at RPI is we bring undergraduates into our research as early as possible and as much as possible. So this entire hockey project has been being led by one research scientist who's a RPI alum who came back and sort of was wanted to do something fun with AI and a bunch of undergraduates. And some of them have done it for credit. Some of it have done it for a little bit of funding during the summer. But really, it's it's amazing what what they've done and how advanced it is and how much fun it is. The demos, things like and that. And how hard is something like that to be able to do a research? You know, reach out to you or any of your colleagues at our, you know, whether it be hockey or some other area of interest. Uh, pretty much any area. So as you know, but the audience doesn't. I was at um, a large state school. Yes. I won't say the University of Maryland College Park. Exactly. For for. 20 years before I came to RPI, and two of the things that really frustrated me there was it was very hard to get undergraduates involved in research, and it was very hard to work on problems like this, like the hockey problem we've been talking about, or some of the health problems, because they, 
everything was owned by a particular department or right. a particular place or a particular thing. RPI is very big on letting people work across traditional right. field boundaries. And um, we have a long history of undergraduate research. Right. So we've built a lot of our graduate research programs on top of already existing undergraduate systems. So you would know the percentages better than I do, but I have never had problems finding an undergraduate no. it, to do a research project. What you're talking about, the Art Rensselaer has a great history of what we call low walls. That you know, yeah. you'll find this compared to other universities where their walls are up. If you're, you have to be this major to do this. It's a lot of interdiscipline play is in place, and uh, we at any time at the undergrad side, we have about a thousand students doing research, uh, which is about fifteen to twenty percent at any time of our student body, which is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, um, and and amazingly talented. Absolutely. And for example, we had a project. I won't go into the details. It had to do with sustainability and energy and things like that. But we were working with one of the local towns. And uh, one of our research scientists came up with an idea implemented by one of our undergraduates in about two weeks, demoed on the floor of Congress uh, within a month. uh, Has led to significant funding um, for those sustainability projects and will now be a focus of further research at RPI. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We will see you back here for part two of our three-part series with Professor Dr. Jim Hendler. Until next time, I'm John Wexler, and this is Crashing the Faculty Lounge.